From the Dallas On Air studios in beautiful Dallas, Texas, this is Fulfillment right here on DallasOnAir.com. And now here's your host, the Mega Bomber, PJ Dunn. Oh, welcome, 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 welcome everybody to The Fulfillment Show. So today, we have some interesting things going on today, because you may have seen some of our advertising where we were going to talk about one subject, but today we're going to run an audible today. We are going to talk about popular movies about summer, which doesn't mean these are movies necessarily that came out in the summer. It's just movies that have this huge focus on summer. So... Uh, yeah. That's good for us here in Texas because we we see an extended summer here, don't we? Oh God, do we see an extended summer? <laughs> it, 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 it starts about what March first and goes until <laughs> Thanksgiving. Uh, pretty much, pretty, pretty much. much. God, and and that's and that's one of the reasons I love Texas. I I'm not a Texan, but I got here as quick as I could, and I mean I hopped the first scholarship right now. <laughs> so yeah, I'm there with you. And apparently a lot of people have done that because we've got a lot of people here from all over. You know, there's, as I see people from other cities wearing their Packers gear or their San Francisco gear or something whenever yeah. NFL kicks in. So yeah. I'm like, what are, what, what's going on? Permanent summer vacation. Just saying. <laughs> That's man. true. Just saying. That's true. And if you're not from Texas, let me just tell you, we're going to drive around with our convertible tops down in, ter in terms of in October, November, we can do that. We're wearing short sleeves and shorts during Thanksgiving. So, yeah, we, we kind of kind of got a good We here. grill during Thanksgiving. <laughs> we grill during Christmas, man. <laughs> <laughs> maniacal laugh, maniacal laugh. <laughs> yes, so uh, that might be the case. And so if you're here for the first time, yeah. uh, hello, welcome, glad to see you. And feel free to go ahead and when this gets released on YouTube on the Vega Bomber channel, go ahead and subscribe and hit that bell when that happens so you get notifications and know all about this. But if this is your first time, this is the show where we discuss all things movies, uh, movie collecting, movie chatter. We'll talk about the director. We'll talk about the director's mama. No, not that far. But sometimes. We might. I don't know. <laughs> that might be a show idea. Hey. <laughs> director's your mama. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually th uh, episode 13 of season three. And today we're going to talk about movies that are all about summer and summer is a key theme to it and then it breaks out into several different kinds of genres actually yeah Did you notice that yeah it does it does uh, uh and like i said you, you you've got the coming of age film you've got the, the camp film you've got you've got a lot of stuff in there what and i think we're going to cover quite we're going to cover quite an extent of it so yeah yes yes we do and so let's do that let's what we normally do is our first segment we call it just seen it and when we do just seen it just seen it just lets you know what we've been watching and gives you an idea of the kind of films that we watch and then that lets you know oh i think i'm gonna like kazak more i'm gonna like vega bomber more johnny but just seen it is just that and so i'll start off with what i've just seen actually i've seen something really really good I'm, i was actually pretty excited about this and i think because it was a pleasant surprise and this is a movie called let him go and this movie came out uh, actually in 2020 but then COVID happened, so they shut down theaters, and so most people didn't get a chance to see it. But it's out now, thanks to HBO Max. And so Let Him Go stars Diane Lane and Kevin Costner, but not as Mom Paul Kent this time. But as this couple that's retired, they live on this ranch in Montana. They have their son, who also has his wife and his newborn, all living with them. And this film starts off what seems like it might be a family drama, a little slow build, but actually... It turns into a suspense thriller that has some real horror violence in it, and you don't see the tonal shift coming, Kazak. It's, it's crazy. So I'm watching yeah. this film, and I'm thinking, okay, not bad, not bad. Diane Lane is chewing up the scenery great here. But then when the movie decides to switch gears and, and shift tonally, you're just not ready for it. I don't think I've seen anything like this. I can't remember a film that had such a graphic tonal turn, but it actually worked here. Okay. <laughs> It actually really worked here. So what happens is, is, is just as a synopsis, so Diane Lane and uh, Kevin Costner are the, the Blanchards, or I'm sorry, the Blackledges, and evidently their daughter, uh, their daughter-in-law, um, decides to remarry when her you know, husband dies unexpectedly. But we don't know nothing about this family that she's marrying into, and this family is the Wee Boy family, and it's led by a matriarch character played by Leslie Mansville, and she is 
ruthless, mm. absolutely ruthless, and she's raised all these boys, and so she's all about, I'll take care of my kids, and I don't care what they've done, they've not done anything wrong, okay. right? And so when you see that, it has one of the most uncomfortable uh, dining room table scenes where you know the, the black ledges show up, <laughs> okay. and they're there to ask about hey, we haven't seen our grandson in a while. Your son has taken our daughter-in-law and they've just moved and didn't tell us. We just want to see our grandson. How are things? All right. Right? And you get this innuendo where she's joking about, oh, no, you mean you're not here to eat some of my pork chop? You're here to talk about something other than me? And everybody goes, ha, 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 ha. And they laugh. But you could tell there's something dark about why she's saying this. And then you can't tell when she's serious or is she trying to be joking? And the, just the tension at the table where where Diane Lane and, and Kevin Costner are looking back at each other going, oh, crap, we might just be in trouble. We're in a horror, <laughs> we're in a horror film right now. Yes, and it flips to like a horror film type sensibility. And it's you just don't see it coming. And you know how I'm, I love villains in a movie? Um, Leslie Mansville plays an excellent uh, foil here to Diane Lane. Here are two moms that care about their sons, but the length that they're willing to go, and then the trouble it puts Kevin Costner in because he's outmanned. He's the only one there, and this woman has nothing but sons, and they're all eating at the table, laughing, almost like this deliverance vibe. And he's noticing, oh man, if this goes wrong, it's just me yep. against all of them. <laughs> so this film was incredible. Um, have you seen anything kind of like this? Can you think of a movie that had such a, a tonal shift that, but that worked? Oh, let's see. Um, I I gotta think about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't. I, I, it was hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, something that takes kind of a, a shift into a second gear. Um, I'm 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 just I'm just going through horror films in my head that can, because that's usually going to be uh, that. Uh, yeah, I, I I couldn't think of one to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, I, like I said, I I I have never understood the love for Kevin Costner. I know you're, I know you dig him because of mm -hmm. because of Yellowstone and things like that. Yeah, I've just never gotten the that he's you know he he has a total shift. He goes from aggravated to slightly annoyed. Just that the, the man has no expression. Mm -hmm. Diane Lane I can buy because she's a fine actress. Oh uh, and, and her chewing up the scenery. So. Uh, it, so it, yeah, it, it seems it seems like this one might be interesting if it, if it just wasn't for Kevin Costner. <laughs> I, 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 I just don't know how the game's getting worked, but still, um, yeah. Uh, but but it, it does sound but it does sound intriguing, mm. uh, especially with the tonal shift. Because again, yeah, mm. you you've because again you've kind of got. Uh, you know th that that trip where it just goes really wrong really fast. Mm -hmm. um, I, like I said, I have to give it some thought to think about even movies to take that kind of hard shift. But yeah, well, the thing I'll say about Kevin Costner here that works is that he's not he doesn't need to play a whole lot. He has to just be the opposite of his wife. So his wife Diane Lane is caring, charming. She loves to cook, and that's mm -hmm. how she wins you over. And her husband needs to be the opposite. So he's he's basically the get out of my lawn type character because he's a former uh, sheriff. So he's seen a lot of crap in his life. So he's kind of like the, you know, maybe more realistic, pessimistic, and she's the more optimistic. And she just has all this hope. And Diane Lane just carries that so well with okay. her ability to just see hope. So he really just needs to play the part that he plays already in Yellowstone, and he's already graded it. <laughs> so it works. You know, that, that gruffled, grizzled cowboy tough guy type thing but also has a soft side for his family will do anything for his family so it does work here but what i, I have to say i mean i love villains and yeah. Leslie mansville here i was actually terrified of what she might do and with her big goon sons what they might perpetrate yeah. on them you know and so that table scene is incredible because there's diane lane pushes back she, because she's a, she's grown, she was raised on a ranch, so she's not the typical. I'm just dainty and need my husband to save me. She grew up on a ranch, so she doesn't take the mess off of, off of Leslie Mansfield character, which is uh, Blanche is her name. And so watching that and knowing that Kevin Costner's going, oh please don't start no mess, 
because I'm outmanned and I don't Ooh, have my gun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going, okay. Like if you've ever been in that situation where you're with your girlfriend and she smarts off to somebody that's like maybe some big gym dude and you're going, okay, right. okay, uh, honey, I know I got to defend you, but please don't take this. And so watching, you know, um, uh, Blanche here go at Diane Lane, who's her name is Margaret, uh, Margaret Blackledge. So yeah. watching Blackledge and Miss Wee Boy kind of trade these barbs at the table. Mm -hmm. you're just going, oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's outnumbered. And the more that they sit at the table, more of the other of her sons start walking in. Okay, so you so you, you get that they're outnumbered here real quick. Big time. And then they allude to it. They go, what y'all going to do? And then they start laughing. There's more of us than you. And they start laughing with that maniacal laugh. And you just see Kevin Costner's face just go. And you can tell like a cop. He's looking at his surroundings. He's trying to imagine where would be our exit. Or might, what might I grab yeah. to help me, right? In that scene from there for the next 35 minutes, you're going, oh, my God, how do they, how do they get out of this? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's incredible. It's a great watch. It's, I will admit it is a little slow in the beginning, but that's because this film is trying to breathe and let you see how these characters are really real. Like, you see it. Like, you really buy the relationship between Diane Lane and, and uh, Kevin Costner. And then her love for this son, this grandson named Jimmy. And then from there, it just goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, once you're off to the races, you are really off to the races. All right. I'll buy, I'll buy it. I'll yeah. Buy it. Take, a, take a look at it. And I'll tell you, there's one big, one cinematic thing that I love here. That okay. This movie does I haven't seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. It does not tell you. It shows you. And mm. when it's showing you, it doesn't show you the obvious thing. It shows you a glimpse of something. Yeah. And you see it and you go, okay, I should note that because I'm seeing this. And then sure enough, you have to find out later on. But it lets you put together what happened on this in scenes. So it does show and tell well. It does not tell or use a lot of exposition to jump cut a lot of scenes. It yeah. just says, here's the scene. And here's the part of the scene that's going to tell you why this is a problem. Yeah, I would say that you, <laughs> you don't get that in a lot of uh, American cinema. I think you get it more in, like, Asian cinema. Yes. Because I was going through a couple of uh, you know, films uh, that have an abrupt tonal shift, and the one that I could come up most with was Audition. Mm. Because okay. if, you go, if you go for Audition, Takashi Miike, uh, you're seeing, okay, this starts out as, you know, a guy looking for romance, looking for love, a widowed guy, and then it goes dark. And I mean, it goes dark because you, he, he tries to find out about her and about her past and things like that. And then all the creepy stuff starts coming up and you see that she's this crazy obsessed woman. And then, then when mm. I say crazy, I mean, she is bent. In. Have you ever seen Audition? I have not. I've heard about it, though, it, it, it but I need to watch it, apparently. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I can't give away anything in the film because okay. it, 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 because, but because it is profoundly disturbing. But yeah, you don't get that so much. In American cinema, uh, but I mean, uh, you know, like you get in like Bong Joon Ho films and things like that. So you're mm -hmm. getting it in more uh, films that can take that shift. But yeah, the, the, you get that sense of menace. I mean, you you get in you know films like uh, Cabin in the Woods or things like that. You get that's the great thing about horror and really good mm -hmm. horror directors that yeah. they can do that abrupt tonal shift when they need to. Yes. So, yes. Wow. So, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I'll get I'll get I'll give you that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I think this is good. So I think that, so it's a recommended only because you just don't see any of this coming. That's the other thing. A lot of movies today, you can see what's coming yeah. in this movie. There might be one or two things that make sense that you might see coming, but the rest of it, you just don't. And then from there, you're just like, okay, I'm invested. Yeah. <laughs> so what about you? What have you seen uh, lately? Okay. Zach? Okay. So, uh, one that I recently found uh, on HBO max, uh, was a, uh, uh, kind of a British cop. Uh, comedy called Avenue Five. Uh, this one stars Hugh Laurie uh, as a ship's captain on a space cruise. Hmm. Uh, uh, he's at the behest of a maniacal uh, <laughs> trainer, gazillionaire, played by Josh Gad. And oh. what happens is uh, uh, while these really, you know, snotty cruisers uh, on a, a spaceship, uh, things go wrong and what was supposed to be, you know, a short, you know, three month journey or something like that turns into three years. And if, and just, you have just bad industrial accidents happening one after the other, oh, gravity shifts, uh, uh, physics change, things like that. And that, 
and you get people getting really pissed off being trapped in space. <laughs> and I mean, it, 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 it is, it, it, it's a ship full of rich Karens who things oh. just go wrong. And when you have the Elon Musk character giving you really stupid orders, insulting NASA who are trying to get you home, it's so, it, it's very British in the fact that, okay, <laughs> I don't mean to offend you, but I'm going to offend you. And then it just starts going south really quick because you have incompetent people at the helm of something <laughs> really <laughs> technical and dangerous. But, oh, my God, it, 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 it's, it, it's hysterical in the fact that it feels kind of improvisational. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, you've got Hugh Laurie who, uh, you know, if you know him from House or if you know him from uh, – uh, you know, Black Hat or things like that. You just mm -hmm. know him as someone who really knows how to take him out. And again, it, it even pokes fun at him because mm -hmm. he takes on, you know, the Sterling captain, you know, things like that. You know, he's not qualified and he shifts back to his British accent and things like that. So, <laughs> it, so it, 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 it is absurdly funny. And again, uh, w when you have, you know, a ship full of Karens that get everything taken away from them <laughs> and realize we're stuck here, we're screwed here, it goes wrong. Really, oh, my really gosh. Fast. But, but, yeah, the, the whole cast is just uh, kind of off-the-cuff improvisational. You know the direct, it's just one of those shows that the director just kind of lets him go and lets him go and lets him go. So this this is one that really lets you get them out there. And, of course, Josh Gad is hysterical. It's kind of like a crazy Elon Musk. I know everything because I'm rich. Because I'm rich. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it really is just fan. It's a fantastic watch. Check it out on uh, HBO Max. It's, it's it's also on HBO Max. So it looks like HBO Max is kind of putting some good stuff out. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it 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 is coming to its own as a streaming service. I mean, it, it is one of the higher paid ones. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but again. With HBO Max, you're getting, you know, not only uh, the HBO and the Cinemax stuff, you're also getting uh, the Turner Classic Movies. You're getting the Adult Swim stuff. You're yeah. getting a bunch yeah. of Studio Ghibli. So you're getting, like I said, it, it, it's it's one of those streaming services that for right now is definitely worth the money. Wow. And, of course, they're getting, you know, so they're, they're getting, because of the COVID, they're getting a whole bunch of exclusives and things like that. They're getting first runs that are going right into the theaters without having to pay that premium price. Wow. Like Disney, hello. I don't really <laughs> yeah. want to pay for Black Widow. <laughs> I don't want to pay for Black Widow, but, right. yeah. Right? <laughs> so. Well, no, that's, that's okay, so that's good. I hadn't seen Josh Gad in a while. I think the last time I saw him was in that movie about Thurgood Marshall, where he played second to uh, Chadwick Boseman, Rest in Power. Uh, that's the last time I saw him, and I was impressed with what he was doing there. So, And I know he can do comedy well, so yeah. since that's what his background yeah. is. Yeah, and there was a, a, a series of interviews that he did on uh, uh, YouTube uh, last year. Uh, where he's uh, reuniting casts of like 80 films and things like that, doing like a Zoom meeting. And I know Zoom meetings are boring, but he's getting casts of like the Karate Kid uh, and uh, oh, wow. uh, the Goonies and things like that. So he's getting a whole bunch of people together. You know, he's kind of doing it for charity and things like that. But it's it, it's kind of like an hour long retrospective interview mm -hmm. of uh, you know just really cl uh, classic fun films. Uh, Wayne's World was one that I really enjoyed because he's getting everyone in on a meeting talking about the film. So it's it, it, so go. I can't remember what it's called. I have to go look it up and I'll wow. do that while we're. It almost sounds like another time. show idea now. The show yeah. idea is what are our favorite characters doing now when yeah. they were kids playing a certain role? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You I'll know, look. like uh, what do they look like now? What are they yeah. doing now? Yeah, I'll I'll look it up and we'll get we'll get, we'll get it in a minute. But yeah, uh, yeah, let, let's let's keep rolling because we yeah 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 we, we got we got we plenty of stuff yeah, to talk we got about. A topic, today. man, we got a topic today. Yes, we do. And so with that, let's get into that. So all you viewers at home, if you saw the thumbnail, you know that what we're talking about is summer movies that are all about well, summer itself, and not necessarily movies that are released so released in the summer. So that is a distinction I wanted to make. So if you don't see Star Wars on here or. E.T. or this sort of thing, that's why. Yeah. So think about this. This summer matters a lot, k Zach, because this is the first summer post-pandemic. So we remember last summer, we couldn't get out and do real summery things. Right. But now we can, and so it makes sense that you'd want to watch films about summer to get you in that summer vibe so you can go do some things. So you think about these summer movies, you, like you said earlier, there's this, this coming-of-age piece to it. Yeah. There's right. summer camp. There's family vacation yeah and right? yeah <laughs> and and i mean because i mean you, you you're you're a film nerd like me you yes. you know that when we were out when we were out of school where did we camp out we camped out in the movie theater 
Mm-hmm. I recall t- summers where I spent every Friday night there at mm-hmm. a theater. I, I, and, you know, I'm, I'm 10, 11, 12 years old, and I'm going to go see great summer films. So, yeah. like I said, this 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 is this is this is one of those that I definitely was uh, kind of a talk <laughs> I'm kind of looking forward to. So. Yeah, because when you think about it, these and these summer films are so powerful, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, that on rainy days you can watch them and feel as if it's sunny outside because these films make you usually feel pretty yeah. good, right? And then there's even horror films that are the subject of some of these summer movies as well. So you can't escape blood from sometimes from summer films. Yeah, and, and, and I think this is kind of a continuation from our topic from our last show, uh, which we went over the great American films. We went, uh, we kind of took it, kind of extended. We could have included some of those on our list today because they are really great. Uh, you know, Amer- some of these are really great American films, but like I said, these are great films that, about one of the best times to be in America, which is summer. Yes, because, because school's out. You, you, life is happening. It, it, it's fun. It's 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 a time to get out, and it's a good time to you know if you if you've got your COVID shots and get your COVID shots, get your vaccines. If you've got it, it's it's a good time to get out and have fun and and go enjoy a movie. And these are movies that you can sit down and enjoy. You know, in in a, in a cool house and air conditioning things like that. Enjoy watching a film. Yeah, and in fact, I would add to that that you know because we are in Texas and the heat is magnified, <laughs> amplified in the summertime. Why else wouldn't you be in a nice, cooled, air conditioned theater watching some of these films? It's Precisely. kind of a way to get out. If you don't have a pool here in Texas, then the thing you're going to do is probably go to a movie theater because we keep they keep the mo- the movie theaters ice cold here yes. in Texas, don't they? Thank <laughs> God. <laughs> That's right. So let's jump into it and. Why don't you kick it off, Kazak, and just give us one of the movies that have made your list. We're going to cover right. our top five, but okay. give us one. Okay. Uh, so I will start off with, um, yeah, we'll start off with this one. Uh, it, uh, get to my camera here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I picked one that w- it, it's kind of right out of school uh, because it is a film that kind of exits right out of school. And that is almost famous. Cameron Crowe's kind of oh, autobiographical yes. uh, mm-hmm. journey uh, uh, through uh, looking at a 70s band. And I mean, this is uh, a really great look at kind of uh, American journalism. And, uh, you know, what's more, mm-hmm. what was a more fun American pastime than to go follow a band? And you've got just yeah. a really great coming of age story. Because, I mean, you know, you've got the guy who's obsessed with the girl and obsessed with the, and then meeting new friends and, uh, you know, writing about something they love is music. It, it, it's a kid chasing his passions through the summer. Uh, and, of course, like I said, you're getting this from uh, kind of uh, a, a lot of this from Cameron Crowe, who, like I said, this is a semi-autobiographical film mm-hmm. of his experiences writing for Rolling Stone. So you get a kid who's, uh, you know, kind of uh, going against his mother's wishes. And it's like, Mom, I'm just going to go out for, you know, <laughs> a, a couple of weeks and I'm going to go do what I love. And you know Francis McDormand, who was a fan, who was a fantastic mom in this. But he goes out and he goes after the band. He goes after sh- finding out, like I said, what it means to be in a band in the seventies. Yes. Got, you know Billy Crudup yes. is a great as a, uh, you know, a great rock guitar player. You got Jason Lee as a great front man, and mm-hmm. of course you got Kate Hudson in a film that really defines her career because she is that beautiful ingenue, uh, you know, uh, just er- everything you want in the girl you're chasing. Yes. Uh, 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 it, she, <laughs> and and it's chasing you can't have it. It's that unrequited love, and it's it's just a really fun film to go watch when when you're ready for that. When when you know that rock and roll, when you know that passion, when you know that thing that just kind of gets you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And almost famous really is that great telling of that story. Yeah, and I, I loved the phrasing when I was watching the film that she kept saying. She would say, "It's happening! It's happening!" You know, so like it's like this, hey, something's going on and I'm a part of it and I'm in it. So it's yeah. happening rather than, hey, what's up? Like what has happened? Right. But she's yeah. saying it's happening. It's happening. And so she's doing the thing. Yeah. Her journey. About. Really excited about. And, you know, like I said, she she she's the groupie or the band aid, you know. Yeah. Uh, different protocols and things like that. But yeah, she's a young girl who's, you know, swept up in doing in being young. Mm-hmm. And that and that's that's what makes her really fun in the film. See, and this is a big uh, add-on to it in terms of like what summer does. Like summer yeah. is that time where you are discovering yourself because you know school is now out, 
So you don't, you're not confined by reading, writing, and arithmetic anymore. It is now, what are you going to do? Who are you going to do it with? And what kind of fun can you get into? What kind of exploration can you get into? What might you learn? And so, yeah, that's why summer seems to be such a, a fun... Like, I don't think you'll have, like, one called Winter Movies where people are talking about how great winter is, but you will have that You, you got the thing. <laughs> <laughs> you pretty much got the thing. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> well, the film that, um, that makes my list, and I'm, I like to go, as you know, bottom to top, you know, from the bottom uh, to the top. And so it was a film that was released in 1993 about some teenagers from Austin, Texas. So we got a Texas connection here. Mm -hmm. In the summer of 1976, and if you remember, in 1976, and this film is called Dazed and Confused. Oh, God, I love this film. So this film is great. Now, I love the soundtrack as well because it fits the summer of 76. That means the biggest band in 76 was Kiss. Yeah. 76, 77. So you get Kiss in the soundtrack as well as other good rock bands that were happening in the 70s. So that's part of that soundtrack. But you just, you love it. And some people say that this might even be Matthew McConaughey's breakout role. I don't know. But they say that this is what kind of put him on the map. Because that line about, you um, know, that's what I like about high school girls. As I get older, they stay the same, same age. age. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Right? And I mean, and just look at this whole idea of, Hear these kids saying, okay, we want to celebrate that this is the last day of high school. We're going to go hang out at our normal watering hole, this popular pool hall, right? And then next thing you know, they're going to this impromptu keg party. And then it just all this life just kind of ensues. <laughs> yeah, it, it is one really fun night in Texas. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that and that's the cool thing about it because I mean, it, yeah, I mean, you grew up in Texas, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and you know, you you know the summer hunt, you know, you know the senior hunt, you know, uh, uh, you know, chasing after the kid and the, making that transition from middle school to high school and things like that. In the mm -hmm. high school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not uh, you have the rebellion of uh, the kid not wanting to sign the the pledge to do football because he just wants to be a he just wants to have his summer. He yeah. wants to be. He wants to be a slacker. That's fine. That's that's what you do when you're that age. <laughs> to enjoy slacking, man. Yeah. And and like I said, and and because you have Texas where high school football is a religion, it's definitely going mm -hmm. against that religion. So it's got a really kind of fun undercurrent. It does, and you get to see a, a young Ben Affleck in this, and there's Adam ben. Goldberg that's in this as well, and Joey yeah. Lauren Adams is in this. So you're getting to see some of these folks as they're really kind of cutting their teeth into diving into some actors yeah. uh, action scenes or actually just scenes period that that's what would happen in high school you would have some of these conversations that they're having and when these kids yeah. are really into it and they're getting into their weed and all this other stuff and just the the yeah. thought processes that they're going on just diving into just the minutiae of things and then trying to tell you no this is what history really was it was really yeah. more like this and so yeah you've got yeah you've got the smart kids the dumb kids the joiners the things like that you you really kind of got all every you recognize these people from your high school. You recognize yes, you these do. people from your own experience, and it, it for, even though it is like a capsule encapsulated uh, in the seventies, it really is kind of a timeless film. Richard Linklater really knocks it out of the park on that one. Yes, he does, and I, I really appreciate the fact, and he produced it as well as, as writing it. So this was something that was made at a small little budget of six point nine million, mm -hmm. and at the box office it did eight million, but in our hearts it did. 25 million because <laughs> yeah because it, yeah, it's definitely one of those films where, where you can turn it on at any time when it's running on television just go i'm good i'm i'll, I'll watch this that's fine mm -hmm. it, it, it's great on repeat viewing yes so what if, what's another one i'm curious to hear all right um let's see i'm going on this list all right uh okay so one that i picked uh, i picked wes anderson's moonrise kingdom Hmm. Uh, I I absolutely love the song. It is it, it's a new one, uh, and of course, like I said, you've got that really stylized Wes Anderson uh, look to it. Uh, you've got two kids who are you know basically misfits in their own. Uh, a girl whose parents don't get her, a, a, a foster kid who basically has no family. Uh, they fall wow. in love, they run away, and they have this great runaway story. And of course, it's the her parents and uh, his caretakers trying to chase after him. He's basically a Boy Scout gone bad. Uh, but I mean, you've got you, you've got a lot of the typical Wes Anderson suspects in here: Bill Murray, uh, mm -hmm. Bruce Willis, Francis McDormand, Tilda Swinton. Uh, uh, all these, all the uh, Edward Norton Jr., who is fantastic in the film. But I mean, uh, it, it uh, like I said, you've got kind of that coming of age. 
couple on the run. Uh, but, you know, it's it's 13, 14-year-olds, so what can they get into? Uh, but again, like I said, it's got that, you know, retro Wes Anderson style, which, and it, if you hate Wes Anderson, you're not going to like this film. You're, you're, <laughs> oh, wow. you're just not because it is, it's not like peak Wes Anderson, like, uh, uh, you know, the hotel movie, I, name escapes me right now. Mm -hmm. But it but it really is, you know, that really stylized uh kind of weird retro feel. Uh but it, it's just fun. Uh it, it really is kind of a fun uh runaway story. Uh and of course uh, if you like Wes Anderson filmmaking, mm. uh it, it really is uh, one of his better it really is one of his better ones. Um Wow, just that's uh, pretty high praise. Because you, you've got you've got those colors, you've got those moving set pieces. I mean, and it, it it it's not Royal Tenenbaums, but it is uh, just a really kind of well done summer runaway film. Hmm. So, uh, so I highly recommend summer it. runaway film. So now I haven't seen this one. So um, is it one of those films that it does it leave you okay? The runaway was bad. Or does it leave you with no? The runaway was great because they discovered this, this, and this. I mean. It, What's the? Is it, there a message in it? Would you say or no? It's just. It, it's kind of a love conquers all type story. Okay. But again, like I said, you've got two, you know, thirteen year old, two twelve, thirteen year olds, kind of on the run, discovering, you know, what it means to be, what it means to have those hormones, what it means to be, uh, you know, crazy passionate about someone that you'll risk everything to do it, and like, and uh, you've got, of course, the runaway story, like we can run away and be together and survive. Things like that, uh, but of course, like I said, you have the impending adulthood and things like that, and you have miserable adults. It's like, why do we want to be miserable adults like you when we're being when we're okay being kids mm -hmm. like us? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it it's got it's it's just a really fun stylized comedy. Wow, um, I I I wholly recommend it. Okay, well, I'm into that. I have to check that sort of thing out. And so, the the film that also made my list was. Almost in the same sense, another coming of age kind of comedy, but it w it actually came out <laughs> on August first, which is my birthday. But August first, nineteen seventy three. This is a film directed by uh, George Lucas, but produced by Francis Ford Coppola, and the film is called American Graffiti. Yep. And so instead of being set in the seventies, like the other one, Days and Confused, this one's set in the sixties, uh, sixty two, and not taking place in Texas. This one's actually happening in California. And what I love about this film was the 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 preeminence of car culture. So yeah. back in the 60s it was about, you know, freedom and freedom was if you could have a car and if you could have a car it, could you did you have a cool car and then if you didn't have a cool car did you have a fast car? So, you know, we get to follow the story here of these friends, Kurt, Steve, Terry and John as all they're doing is just cruising the small, you know, streets, the streets yeah. of small town California, they're just looking for something to get into and fun and what ensues and the daring, oh, I dare you do this and this sort of thing going on. And, and it stars people who we, we love, right? So we love Harrison Ford, who's in this. In a very small role, but it's super uh, but small. It's one of, but it's one of his first. Mm -hmm. And Richard, uh, Richard Dreyfus is in this. Mm -hmm. We also have Cindy Williams. So if you're not sure of her, Laverne and Shirley, she played Shirley. Mm -hmm. So she's in this as well. Mackenzie Phillips is in this. So this has Ron Howard, right? The, Ron Howard, like, uh, is this pre Happy Days or post Happy Days? Or right in the middle of it? Yeah, this is. I think it's pre. Yeah, yeah but yeah. <laughs> so you, you know, here you go, and it's like, I mean, what's the most freeing thing I remember in the summertime was being able to have a car and being able to drive and go see your friends and go pick them up, or to go meet them places. If you don't have a car to go do that, so this is like looking at it from that. Also, that teenage perspective as well, because, you know, that's pretty big. Whether you had a car or didn't, meant a lot about how much more fun you could get into, or Precisely. so it seemed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, it, it, it is George Lucas's love letter to hot rod culture, man. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, you, you see all those great cars, and you see those souped up cars, uh, you know, running late at night. And I mean, we, we and I mean, when, when you're that age and things like that, because we, we, we both, I, my my uh, town was built around cruising culture. Mm -hmm. it, it really was because I mean there was nothing to do. There was yeah. literally nothing to do where I grew up. So it, again, I, I didn't have the car, and I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. So getting to go on you know that ride and things like that that's a big deal, man. It is. I remember just the different parts of Dallas and the different parts of even Arlington where there were just strips where people just went to on Friday and Saturday nights to cruise. 
And that's all it was. You just got in your car, you went to the strip, and you got into the line of all the cars that would go down south, down Collins, and then you'd turn and come back up Collins, and you'd just do this all night, just going up and down the strip, seeing who all the people are there. Mm -hmm. People would have their music blasting, and they'd turn up so they could hear what they liked the best, so you could hear mm -hmm. some rock, you could hear some metal, you could hear some hip-hop, you could hear, you could just hear anything. But people just wanted to get out, it wasn't illegal, you know, to just cruise the strip, so you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that, and that was the thing. It was getting into tr it was getting into trouble and doing what you weren't supposed to do, but doing everything that you were supposed to do because you're growing up and hitting that age, man. Yeah, yeah, you just can't be replaced. What's yeah. another one on your list? All right, so uh, w one that I picked is one that I think is kind of one of those comedies that's really off the radar, and I know, like I said, it it, it definitely is. It's one that I'd pick because it is so off the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, it is uh, David Wayne's Wet Hot American Summer. Okay. So the premise I've of the film. I've heard about The this. premise of this film. Uh, okay. Uh, the premise of this film is, okay, what if you have, what if you have a summer camp movie? Mm -hmm. Okay. The last day of summer camp movie. Now, what if you take every summer camp movie and throw it into one summer camp movie? <laughs> And uh, you you get a cast that is really good improvisationally. Uh, you've got David Hyde Pierce, Janine Garofalo. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got, and of course, you've got a whole bunch of folks from the state. Uh, the state was a comedy sketch show on MTV, and the state after the state ended kind of went into two camps. You've got uh, the uh, Thomas Lynn, Ben Garant, Carrie Kinney uh, camp, who went on to do Reno 911 and okay. Night at the Museum and things like that. And then you've got the other folks: David Wayne, Michael Showalter, and Michael Ian Black who uh, uh, went on to form Stella, and of course they wrote this movie. And this movie is just basically every summer camp movie crammed into one summer camp movie. <laughs> so, you get, so you're getting, you know, that they're going to close down the camp. They're going to, they have a, a meteor crashing into the camp. You've got the uh, uh, drama kids creating the summer camp musical. You've got uh, the the summer romance movie, but I mean, it's it's the unrequited summer romance and the gay romance. It's every, it's every kind of wonderful little satire thing that you've got. <laughs> and of course you've got people way too old to be playing teenagers playing teenagers. So you you get that involved, and but I mean, you've got a really well thought out improvisational cast, Paul Rudd, uh, things like that. Just all these people who come up and with all this weird stuff. Um, uh, Chris Maloney plays this guy who uh, is he's kind of like a crazy uh, Vietnam veteran, things like that, mm -hmm. whose best friend is a talking can played by John Benjamin. It's, I wish I could explain it better than that, but I wow. can't. Wow. It's so bizarre and out there, but it is so funny. Uh, I, 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 I've I seen this film like three or four times, and then of course uh, it extended into a series on Netflix, uh, 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 but it, it's just worth watching. Uh, Bradley Cooper, Amy Poehler, just all these great com comedy luminaries of uh, the modern of our era right now, oh doing a really fun summer camp movie. Uh, that I highly recommend. Just if you want something stupid and bizarre, get this film. Wow, how about that? So, well, yeah. I'm I'm in. I'm in to check yeah. that out. That sounds good because. Uh, you know, again, I'd rather be inside in the air conditioning than out there in that heat right now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, my film that I picked next then is actually, I should have this a lot higher, but it is Spike Lee's 1989 movie, Do the Right Thing. Oh. And man, there's so much to cover in this. This film is phenomenal in many different ways. So you've got Spike Lee playing Mookie. You got Danny Aiello as Sal and Rosie Perez as Tina and Giancarlo Esposito as Bugging Out, mm -hmm. which we all know him from Breaking Bad now and a few other joints he's been doing. Mm -hmm. John Turturro, Bill Nunn. I mean, you've got this star-studded cast, and this one is taking place a summer in Brooklyn. This is up in Brooklyn, and it's just about how Bugging Out kind of goes into this Italian pizzeria and looks up on the wall as he's eating pizza and notice that there's nothing but Italians on the wall. There's no black people. And so he thinks, well, because you're in the hood here, shouldn't you have pictures up on the wall of some black folks too? Because we spend a lot of money up in here. And so, boom, you get this whole racial thing going on. And it's interesting because whenever things are hot, whenever it's things are heated temperature-wise, it doesn't take long for the temperature to rise in terms of people's feelings and emotions about each other either. In fact, when you see a lot of damage and carnage that goes on or violence, it's usually in the summer. 
And we saw that this past summer, 2020 yeah. here, when you see people just, with, something about the heat just brings things out of people, brings out the, the truthness and whatever it seems. And so this is captured well here. And I love how with his vivid color imagination, well, Spike Lee even just takes just a scene between him and Rosie Perez with just the ice cube. Mm-hmm. And now he's just trying to cool her down by putting ice cube on her. It's very sensual as well. But you've got all of that. So you've got this, well, hey, how are you in our neighborhood doing this? You've got keep people just trying to keep themselves cool in the summer up in Brooklyn, which is usually just busting open one of those little uh, fire hydrants just to get water going out, spreading out all the water all over the place so that kids run out and play in the water and that sort of thing. And it's just another depiction of summer that we wouldn't get looking at it from Texas if we look at Days and Views. It's completely different summers in terms of how they're dealing with the heat, yeah, which I thought was interesting as well. And then being able to smuggle in, and not just smuggle in, but be able to show the, the message, the themes of just different people doing different things and then how we have problems with differences and how we are quick to kind of judge based off of something, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this is the movie that really started my love for independent film. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and like I said, I'll tell my story because, like I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not from Texas. I'm originally from Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like I said, we, d- we did not get this film where I lived. I mean, we did, did, this film did not exist other than in talk on uh, MTV. So, like mm-hmm. I said, this, so like I said, it's, it's, it's night. This film gets released in what, 89? Yes, 89. Okay. Summer. So, I find this film in 90, 1992. Wow. In, uh, uh, and you know, like a little dollar store and things like that, to find the VHS tape. Like, yeah, I'm buying this because I want to see this film. And I see the film, and it's mind blowing. And remember the year that I picked this up. This is '92, LA '92. So I'm watching this right at the peak of Rodney, Rodney King. King. Yep. And I'm it, it. It. You know, I'm you know about. 14, 15 years old, and it blows my mind. Not only the color, not mm-hmm. only the imagery, not only the music, not only the characters, but the tone of the movie. Yes. And it just hits you right where you live because you find you get a movie that you understand how these tempers get so flared and why this thing happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because I mean, we're past spoilers on this. Radio yep. Raheem, played by Bill Nunn, is. Uh, yeah. Killed by cops, and yeah. it starts off, a, and it starts off a riot in in New York, mm-hmm. and I mean, you really get, like I said, tensions aggravating. Mm-hmm. You get that, you get everything kind of building up to this one moment, and it explodes, mm-hmm. and then you have, and then you see the day after, and it's finally cooled out and calm, and but I mean, there's a whole lot of residual anger and things like that, and it's yeah. it, 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 it it's just so many tones. And so many things, but like I said, Spike Lee, you know, getting really kind of gypped at the at the, at the jilted at the Academy Awards, Easily. things like that. Uh, it's it's just a phenomenal film, and it's so worth watching. I mean, at, at at any time, at any point, at any age, it is worth watching again because it's just so rich and beautiful and powerful. Yeah, um, it, 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 it is just one of those films that really just knocks you off your feet anytime you see it. If you if you see it for the first time, if you've seen it for the hundredth time, it's still impactful. It's still good. Yeah, it's still relevant to today, as you were totally. saying. And what's interesting is, is I love how he didn't back away from that. Like he showed, like there's that montage in there where he just shows the different characters giving you their stereotypical beliefs about the other, right? And so you hear every stereotypical nickname of black people, every stereotypical nickname of Italian people, and they just, they show you all that. And then I just love how he was just trying to show the the hypocrisy of it all, where he's talking to uh, John Turturro as Pino in this, where he's he's saying, look, who's your favorite basketball player? It's, it's a black guy, sword, right? And who's your favorite this? And who's your favorite musician? All black, he says. So all your favorite people are black, but then if they come into your restaurant, you don't like them. Yeah. He goes, how do you how do you square that? And like, and that's stuff that we all kind of know, but to see it actually put on the screen and put in a scene and put between these two characters who were understanding who they are. Right. That was just right on the nose. It's like what we needed to hear. And I think yeah. how the film ends too is is wonderful as well because it gives gives you this graphic. It scrolls two quotations at the end of it. One mo- quotation is from Martin Luther King Jr. And the other one is from Malcolm yeah. X and having both, not that it's one or the other. And so you have this jazz, soft jazz playing when Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote is put up there talking about, you know, advocating for peaceful protest. And then 
you have Malcolm X quote saying, I will defend myself. And if and that that's violence, I will use violence to defend myself, right? Yeah. And so you just, yeah. everything you just watched then gets encapsulated by these two quotes by these two very powerful men during that civil rights yeah. movement. And here we are talking about a summer in 1989. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, really, w- it really was and is an amazing wake-up call uh, to different cultures and things like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a small kid growing up in a small town in Wyoming and things like that, and I'm getting my mind blown by this film so it, it's so worth watching again man yeah it's totally it. so if you haven't seen this is definitely a buy so what else have you seen all right uh so uh this next one that i picked like i said we got i had to get a horror one on there and like i said we, we, <laughs> we talked about we talked about friday the 13th on the last show so i couldn't go with that one so i had to go with one uh that you might not that kind of comes at you from left field and it's better than you remember uh, if you've ever seen it. And it's called Sleepaway Camp. Uh, and you have uh, 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 little Angela, uh, a silent girl, and uh, her and uh, her brother who go off to uh, uh, New Jersey summer camp. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, it, it's a serial killer movie. Uh, pe- mm. People at the summer camp are getting knocked off. You see, uh, you know, a, a cook uh, uh, boiled alive. You see, uh, uh, you know, uh, a kid attacked by a hornet's nest. You see uh, uh, a, a girl with a very uncomfortable experience with a, cr- with a uh, curling iron. I won't even go into it. Mm. But, <laughs> but uh, again, what you get with this film is, you know, uh, a small town New York camp, which again, you know, the, 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 uh, summer camp was never one of my things, but again, it was one of those tropes that you get in the movies all the time. Mm. Uh, but this is a really, a really kind of fun but brutal uh, slasher. Uh, and again, uh, you've got, you know, 14, 15 year olds uh, and uh, things like that. It, it, it's not, you know, it's people who aren't, uh, people who aren't, uh, teenagers playing teenagers you really get you know teens speaking the way teens speak at that age uh you get you know a, a very young cast doing really brutal things and they and you get the twist and i they, you you don't need to know the twist if, if you've never seen the film if you do if you have seen the film you know what happens Be, it, it's just bizarre uh but again uh it is kind of uh it's kind of a film hailed by LGBTQ uh, because it's kind of one of those films that it was, it was something that wasn't really talked about in the 80s but was kind of prevalent. Mm-hmm. And it's really kind of got an undercurrent. And it's so nice to see it get a revival nowadays. Um, uh, and, of course, uh, 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 before the COVID hit, I got to meet uh, the star of the film, uh, Fel- Felissa Rose, who was doing appearances in oh, Texas. Wow. The girl is a sweetheart. Uh, wow. just the uh, Just the absolute genuine item she she loves her fans and of course the this is the film that pretty much that really made her career but uh, so she's really embraced it and of course she's uh, embraces her fans and things like that so i cannot speak highly enough of felissa uh, mm-hmm. and her love uh, for this movie and again like i said if you love the 80s slasher film this is one that you really need to check out wow. because it is it, it, uh, it, it is so, some really creative kills, uh, and of course you get that summer camp uh, sensation. But yeah, uh, things go south quick, fast, in a hurry, uh, with kids being mean kids, and of course mean kids doing really, really mean things. So definitely check out Sleepaway Camp uh, because it is just fun. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay, okay, Sleepaway Camp. Yeah, because because this shouldn't be a surprise. Like for summer movie, there should be. A lot of stuff about camp because I know here in Texas we we, we, got, we got a camp for everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> Were you sent away to camp as a kid? Huh? Were you sent away to camp as a kid? Uh, once. Okay, and that's all it took. So I, <laughs> 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 I don't want to go. I don't want to do that again. You better find know. something to do around here. I don't know. I'd go to rock and roll fantasy camp just uh, just because that'd be fun. Yeah. Oh, and see that. that so, I wish so I'd known about those. Camp, camps for adults. That's yeah. Mm-hmm. I wish I knew more about those. <laughs> well, another a film that actually makes my list is a film that had come out in August in uh, 1986. I was graduating high school when this came out. And it's a movie called Stand By Me. What an incredible film. So the, the synopsis of this is basically about these four boys from Oregon who learned that there's a, a dead body out there. And they want to go, go see it because there's something about 
the macabre of it and just like just the natural um uh, like people wanting to see a car wreck you know when you drive by you can't help but to look over and see and so these boys decide we're gonna go and we're gonna make that little trek to go find out you know if we can see this this dead body that's out there and so one of the interesting things about this film that you see is that i, I like that it, is it breaks down that that story that that men are all kind of the same or boys are all kind of the same which is like the rough and gruff and tumble and all that stuff and what you see here is you see different types of boys like some are that way but then some are incredibly sensitive and you see that in some of the characters here and they're crying all of a sudden they're always being told toughen up you know man up in this stuff but you see a wide swath here of young boys and well the one thing that brings them together adventure what might we find? You know, what might we see? What what could we turn over and this sort of thing? And in that, they went into a whole bunch of things. So it was directed by Rob Reiner, who did a great job. And then, of course, it's starring names you would have heard of, like River Phoenix for sure, uh, Corey Feldman, Jerry O'Donnell, Kiefer Sutherland, Richard Dreyfuss shows up yet again, right? And all of them put in, like, these, this, these performances that are completely believable, completely lived in. And you're like that kid. I, I, I know I went back to being that age, 9, 10, you know, 11 years old, and like, yeah, you don't want to just be stuck in a house. If somebody comes up with an idea, hey, let's go do this, you're like, yeah, I'll go do it. Even if it's like, hey, let's go throw rocks at the cat across the street. Sure, you know, you're just looking for anything <laughs> to go do. And so when I saw these boys just get together just for that single cause of adventure, exploration, and then what they learn along the way about life and themselves and about each other, I was like, you know what? This is really, really good. <laughs> you, you've seen this, right, Kazak? I saw it in the theater, and uh, uh, and and like I said, this is like I said, uh, did the right thing is my was my first one that got me into independent film. This is the movie that got me into film. Period. Wow. This because again, I'm seeing this 1986, 1987, so I'm seeing it right at that you know mm. nine, ten, eleven point, mm. and I'm seeing myself on screen. I'm seeing that story of me on screen because you know you've got you've got that you've got those kids you you know kind of hanging out and, and the dregs and uh, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, and you get just such these wonderful, amazing, broad spectrum performances. Rob Ryan really gets uh, the most out yeah. of these four boys: yeah. Will Wheaton, uh, River mm -hmm. Phoenix, who puts in great emotion; uh, Corey Feldman, who's you know over the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, why am I well, Jerry O'Connell playing Vern playing Vern like mm -hmm. he's, he's the fat kid uh, mm -hmm. and things like that you the, these loser kids who go out on who go out on one last adventure of summer because they're right on the point of uh, we're now about to move into uh, this next phase of life and we're going on one last trip mm -hmm. and it and it's to go see a dead body it's to go see a dead body and again you've got you've got a wonderfully rich story by Stephen King you've got great direction by Rob Reiner uh, you've got just phenomenally nuanced performances from very very young performers and you're seeing them on screen I mean this is a film that you absolutely fall in love with every time you see it yeah you know and and it is boys being boys because it is you know the boys you know talking like kids talk and mm -hmm. telling the telling the terrible stories and things like that the only terrible stories that only kids who tell terrible stories tell mm -hmm. you get that vomitorium story <laughs> I think <laughs> just, <laughs> just uh, seeing that on screen you need to get just, a new tongue it, 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 <laughs> It, it 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 is the film that it is for for us when we were going at in that age when we saw that film mm -hmm. at that age it's so relatable oh. uh, and 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 again even though it takes place in the fifties it is a really timeless movie yeah. um and it's just a film that it's really rich and beautiful every time you see it and and it's got wonderful moments of emotion and writing and things like that uh, and character uh, again I I can't speak highly enough of this film. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, because it's the film that I grew up on. I mean, I literally grew up on because I'm seeing it at the exact point in the exact frame in time, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing it at the right time. So yeah, uh, it, it, it is it is that film for me. Yeah, and it's taken from a Stephen King novella. And what's interesting about it is, as well, is just like the scenes are memorable. Like I can't get that that scene of the leeches out of my head yeah. when they discover the leeches. And so you see these kids and you're feeling like everything's all safe and good and they're just walking along the train tracks and they got a stick and they're hitting stick and telling stories like you're saying. And and then for them to fall into peril and this danger, you sense it so much even though you know they're not going to die by the leeches, but you still go, that's a horrible thing to experience so as this kid 
you know. <laughs> and so I still remember that. I remember the mean old junkyard man and, and how they were all like, and how Corey Feldman was just all up in the fence and all just about just yelling at him like a junkyard dog himself and just how they were willing to just go to these places because mom and dad aren't there. So they can be anybody. They can do anything and be anybody while they're out here. Yeah. And they're doing it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It, 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 it is their time. I mean, you know, it, it, Goonies is a fun kind of adventure, adventure film, but this is a film that, that feels like a real adventure. And, yeah. you, get, and you, get, you get that sense of realism uh, out of these performances. And again, it, 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 it's, the, it's a film that, you know, gets, you know, it, it's definitely, I think, in my opinion, River Phoenix's best shot. Yeah, uh, out, out of his young career, and he could have had so much. Uh, oh man! Uh, but of course, Will Wheaton, uh, uh, Corey Feldman, uh, just everyone in that film just really knocks out of park. Heather Sutherland yeah. in his first film, uh, his completely menacing as Ace. It's it's mm -hmm. just it's so good. Yeah, it's it's a movie that, again, if you're collecting DVDs for my DVD collectors out there, if you don't have Stand By Me, I gotta ask you, what are you doing? So go find it, and that's a movie that definitely belongs in your DVD collection. And so what else do you have? All right, so this is gonna be our last one yes. here. Uh, okay, so I chose a film that nobody knows that they've seen, but everybody's seen it. Uh, it, it is a film that... Uh, I think is a really underestimated comedy, an under, under underestimated eighties comedy, mm -hmm. but I I I enjoy it because I enjoy it. It's one of those <laughs> films that I just truly enjoy, and that film is One Crazy Summer, directed by Savage ah. Steve Holland, nineteen eighty seven. Uh, you get John Cusack uh, coming in. You know, this is it's kind of I think it feels like an unofficial sequel to Better Off Dead. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so already you've get you're getting into certain comedy. You're also getting uh, Demi Moore uh, in a fairly early role. Uh, <laughs> if you liked Bobcat Goldthwait in the '80s, it is peak Bobcat Goldthwait. Just saying what that is. And if you don't know what I'm saying, you didn't grow up in the '80s, uh, <laughs> Curtis Armstrong. But again, you get uh, you get a kid you get a kid fresh out of high school uh, going on his last summer adventure because he goes off to college. He goes to Nantucket, winds up in the boat race, saves the girl, saves save, saves the uh, house from being torn down. Whatever. It, it, it's the it's the standard summer it's the standard summer movie. But it's it's a really absurd and bizarre comedy uh, with mm. weird makeup, uh, crazy performances, strange writing. But it's so fun. Mm. If if you liked Better Off Dead, this is that unofficial sequel movie to it. And I, I remember it, it, it was that it was that film that I saw when I'm a kid in the eighties because I got nothing else to do. I wander into the theater, mm -hmm. uh, I plunk down my five bucks, I sit down in my theater. Uh, get my popcorn, get my soda, and I watch this film, bucks. and it's it and it's just funny, and it's and again it was one of those films that just ran on cable over and over again. Mm. So again, I, I watched it over and over again, and I I lost it for years and years and years, and I was always I. I was chasing the DVD for years because I couldn't find it because no one's seen this film, but I love this film. And it's one of those whole, it was one of those holy grails. And I finally found it used in uh, some uh, record store. It's just like, I finally have this film. <laughs> I've missed this film for ages. Mm. And I'll watch it again and again because it's just weird and bizarre. And, and, it, and in my opinion, it is really kind of peak 80s comedy. And again, being a Savage Steve Holland movie, uh, it's kind of an intimate, lovely mm. little romantic comedy, but it's it's still just fun, and it's still it's one of those films that's timelessly fun for me. Yeah, I, it, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but it were but it plays to my level, it plays to my sense of humor, and it was kind of one of those films that yeah, I absolutely love it. Even John Cusack kind of disavows it, but <laughs> I, I I don't care. I love the film. I'll watch it again and again. I don't care. <laughs> Well, you know, you have to pick some of those, and I think uh, I did. I think I followed suit here with my last one, and the last one I picked is it comes from 1980. It's Caddyshack, so of course, directed by Harold Ramis, of course, and you oh, know yeah. Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, Rodney Dangerfield, Ted Knight, <laughs> Michael O'Keefe, Cindy Morgan. I mean, this is one of the what top five funniest movies ever. But yeah, you might say, well, how does this kind of tie into summer and all that? And you look at the main character in this, and it's it's. Danny Noonan, and so he's just this teen who's down on his luck, 
So he's caddying at this very highfalutin type country club to try to raise money for his college education. So it's the summer job. That's the summer job. And that's how it ties. And that's how we get it. Right. And so in this, you let all the hilarity ensue with in terms of just the people that he meets (laughs) in this whole situation. So I love uh, all the phrases, all the catchphrases that come out of this, like in the hole, get in the hole. And, you know, and. (laughs) Or at least I got that going for me. <laughs> right? And it's like, I don't know. The, the film came out, was it July 25th? So it was right in the middle of summer there. Yeah. And it just did something in the terms of comedy, in terms of a sports film in a sense. Because many people would say it's a sports film and that it heavy, it heavy uh, involves golf. But really, um, Rodney Dangerfield... <laughs> And uh, I think I think Bill Murray and of course Chevy Chase might have something else to say about it because once you put them to it, it can become anything it needs to become. Yeah. I, I, I try to imagine how much of the lines were improvised and how much were written. I'm I'm almost willing to bet that most of it <laughs> was improvised by some of them, by most of their statements. But then at the same time, it just comes together. Yeah, it it <laughs> it, 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 it it's a film that's probably about thirty percent improv, seventy percent written. Uh, you've got direction by Harold Ramis, uh, mm-hmm. written by the great Douglas Keeney. Mm-hmm. This is his follow-up to Animal House. Uh, yeah, this is Chevy Chase after he's left Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. This is Bill Murray still in the prime of Saturday Night Live. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield doing his really his first big screen movie, uh, and of course you've got uh, a cast of uh, you know younger actors, uh, things like that in this remarkably funny film. And I mean, it, it's so funny. Uh, the, the unsung hero of this film is really Ted Knight who plays judge Smales, yes. who, you know, just gives the, who just gives that self-important, truly rich, uh, at, at uh, adversity of just the whole film that the, the cla- of, of class and class and warfare and things like that. And of course, it, it really is the summer job. It, 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 it's, 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 doing, it's doing things for money for terrible people. Mm-hmm. Um, um, mm-hmm. But again, uh, it, it is just so funny. And again, uh, you're, you're get, this is at the prime of you know, the National Lampoon class mm-hmm. uh, of comedy. Uh, and again, it, the lines are so quotable. Uh, Chevy Chase, you know, doing what, doing what he does best. Uh, Bill Murray just being off the wall. Uh, and of course, like I said, the gopher. <laughs> when you're a kid, you love the gopher. When you're in, when when you're a teenager, you love uh, the caddy. And when you're when you're an adult, you love uh, uh, Chevy Chase. You, you, it's a film that just kind of speaks to you at every age, and it's just it, it really is one of those it's one of the great comedies of all time. Yes, so. absolutely. When when you're worried about whether Bishop really is dead or not, when he gets struck down by the lightning <laughs> after yelling "rat farts" to the sky, <laughs> I mean, what else more do you need to see? <laughs> or maybe just the uh, the the uh, baby Ruth at the bottom of the pool and oh. <laughs> that's all right. It's not so bad. Yeah. See, I'll break out into fits of laughter again if I go back into some of it. But then again, yeah. Yeah. this is all of it. And, and again, how it relates back to summer is that this is what summer is supposed to be. Yeah. It's not only is it going to be tense and scary and the things you might learn and the, the things that are kind of you don't expect, yeah. but also it's some of the most goofiest, delirious times that you've yeah. ever had. And sometimes you'll 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 block it off in your mind like this. Remember the summer of '89? Yeah. Remember the summer of '74? Yeah. So you're going to have great stories. Some of them are going to be horrific that you had a horrible summer and here's the things that made it horrible. But then you're going to say, here are the ones where I couldn't imagine it to be any better. And so if you're trying to, if you're Danny Noonan in this one, you're just kind of like, look what I get to yeah. be around. And, and who doesn't love Chevy Chase yeah. <laughs> as a golf guru, as if he really plays golf. I don't know if he does or not, but just what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a hole. It's in a hole. Yeah, Bill, yeah. Bill, Bill Murray doing what he does. Yeah, it, 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 it is. It, it's just a really perfect. It's a really perfect comedy. Yeah, and if you don't have that one, which I hope you do, then you got to go buy the steel book of this one and get all the extra features that are in it. So if you're a DVD or Blu-ray collector, just know that the one for Caddyshack is awesome. They make a lot of awesome ones, but the one for Caddyshack is also pretty good. So you might like that. Yeah. 
You might like that. All right, man. Let's get out of here. Come on, man. All right, it's time to go. So um, we're gonna j- jump into our shout outs. Uh, quick shout out for me is to shout out Johnny Flicks. You're wondering where was he today? No, we didn't fire him or anything like that at all. He's at his real job. So uh, we said to go ahead, do your real job thing. And yeah, we'll we're on do summer vacation. He, he's having to do the summer job. He he's caddying for Judge Smales. That's today. exactly what he's doing right about now. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to shout out to him today, and then of course. Um, uh, to Barry and Brandy Austin and Mad Mel and the film samurai himself and Cole and uh, Cole Houston, Eddie Medina, um, Tristan Frazier, and I'm doing a lot of this by the top of my head, and uh, Harry Thomas, and anybody else who I may have forgotten, you too, and definitely Prim um, from his uh, channel, who has lots of great stuff out there if you ever go on Prim's channel. He's been on here. He's a big horror guy, so I want to give a shout-out to Prim for sure. He yeah. watches most of these shows. And you, Kazak? Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and shout-out uh, our Dallas On Air family. Uh, we will go ahead and shout-out uh, Cole Houston, who you'll be able to catch uh, on alternating thurs- on alternating Sundays uh, with us on the Rant Corp Pit Live and, of course, Isle of Toys. Uh, we'll also shout-out uh, our good friend Eddie Medina. Uh, you can catch him on Fan and Wife and uh, Figments, the Explain Mysteries podcast. And also check out the Dallas On Air family. We've got great stuff for uh, the Be True Be You podcast, uh, Best for Business, uh, Say Something, all these great shows. Uh, we've got something for everyone. Everyone right here on DallasOnAir.com. And, of course, shout-outs to uh, Jansen and uh, Kat, who give us a home here uh, every Sunday right here on DallasOnAir.com. Do check us out uh, and uh, uh, dig us, follow us, subscribe, all that good stuff, man. Hit those hit those buttons. Spread the word about this show. If you like what you see, if you like what you hear, uh, let, let them know. Let them know. Let them know. Absolutely. And so with that, we're just telling you, friends, go out there. Enjoy your summer because summers were had for that exact reason. We'll see you the next time. As you remember, we're here every second and every fourth Sunday of the month. And I think the next Sunday will be the 25th. So, yep. We'll be back in two weeks right here in DallasSunnyHair.com. See you. Peace.